Hello and welcome to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Today, we have a very, very special guest joining us in the studio, and she is the Los Angeles County Supervisor for District 4. Please join me in welcoming Janice Hahn. Welcome, Supervisor. Hi, Derek. It's great to be here again. Yes, and I have to say welcome, Supervisor, instead of welcome, Congresswoman, as you were the last time. It sounds good. <laughs> I'm sure it feels good, too. We were just talking. But let's start with what I think is most important, since I'm the grandfather of four, you're the grandmother of five. How's the family? The family's great. In fact, I'm uh, going to be babysitting tonight for two uh -huh. of them. Uh, yeah. I do think in my new job, I'm going to have more time uh, to spend with my family. Uh, really great, smart, adorable, well-behaved <laughs> uh, grandchildren now. It was a little difficult when I was commuting to Washington, right. D.C. to find time for my family, so right. I'm looking forward to that. And that's why I bring that up, because I know when you were here last, we were talking about that, just uh, the wear and tear of flying back and forth, and you were almost doing that on a weekly basis, right? I was doing it on a weekly basis. Right. I would fly to Washington, D.C. on Mondays and fly home on uh, Fridays every week. Not all Congress members do that. I felt it was important to come home to my district every weekend so I could know what people were feeling and hear their concerns firsthand. It helped right. me to be uh, a better member of Congress, I think, to come home regularly. Now, when you uh, have begun to get more uh, ingrained in, in your routine here, do you find that the, the days are just as long without the travel? The days are just as long without travel. Minus the late night votes uh, <laughs> or sit-ins. Right. You know, many times we were called to vote at the Capitol, maybe 11.30, midnight, oh, 1 wow. a.m. Uh, that was uh, not unusual. So here uh, on the L.A. County Board of Supervisors, we only meet one day a week on Tuesdays. Okay. We start at 9.30 in the morning, and we end about 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. So it's a little more civilized in terms of the hours. Right. Now, for those who don't know, you weren't always a politician. I know we touched on this when I originally uh, met you and interviewed you, but you started out in education, and I know with all the changes, especially with our new Secretary of Education, et cetera, uh, what inspired you to make the transition from being an educator uh, to going into the world of politics? I had my secondary credential, my, my life teaching credential, mm -hmm. and so I taught in uh, secondary schools for about five years. And it, it became, for me, I think, my DNA. Uh, at some point, I just realized that public service was a role that I really wanted to pursue, particularly mm -hmm. with my dad, my brother, my uncle. A lot of my members of family had uh, been elected officials, so I think it just... Uh, it came, you know, time for me uh, to choose to be in a public service, and so that's what I've uh, done for the last 15 years. And, and it's interesting you say that because I, I, there's a young man who was a part of our teen program, and uh, and he mentioned to me, you know, Mr. Simpson, uh, with all that's going on politically, I, I think I want to think about going into politics someday. How should I do that? So the question would be then, what would you say to a young person that's, uh, actually taking an interest in being more involved in their community and maybe taking politics as the path to make that happen. Well, I think that's really encouraging for all of us that young people uh, yeah. are taking a look at running for office. It's certainly not for the faint of heart. But I'm reminded <laughs> right. of uh, President Obama when he was saying goodbye mm -hmm. uh, to his friends, his family, his supporters in Chicago. And there was one point where he said, you know what? To stay involved, you should be running for office. Mm -hmm. You should be running for school board, for city council, uh, for county mm -hmm. supervisor, for congress, for senator, for governor. Uh, he really was in encouraging people to run for office. And I would say, you know, you just have to, you have to do it. Uh, volunteer on somebody's campaign first so you understand uh, the ins mm -hmm. and outs of a campaign. But I think that's great that people still want to go into this line of work. Because I think for a while it didn't have... Uh, the best name to, to be a, a politician. Right. And, and someone said that uh, once uh, that anyone can be a politician. It, it doesn't mean a particular degree or a particular discipline. You just have to have that desire to, to go about that and do that, as is evidence in some of our leadership today. 
<laughs> so. That's true. Well, uh, when I was in Congress, you know, you have uh, 434 other people, and they came from a wide variety right. of backgrounds. We had lawyers, right. we had doctors, we had farmers. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, two people in the United States Congress that were auctioneers. So yeah. you're right. You don't need any particular... Uh, right. education or background to become a member of Congress. You just have to want to serve your community. Well, let's talk about Congress before we get into what you're doing locally. Uh, let's maybe reverse back, you know, in the last six months or so leading up to the elections. What was the political climate like prior to you leaving Washington, D.C. and coming back home? Well, when I think when I landed in 2011, uh, I was told that it was probably one of the most politically partisan, gridlocked, Congress that we've seen in a long time. So I sort of spent five and a half years in a very partisan gridlock system. So uh, it was only getting worse uh, during uh, the election time. So we're talking about Congress and we're talking about being in politics and you were speaking to the gridlock that was in, in Congress and in 2011 moving forward. How is it that uh, you think things might change, or, or will they change as a result of the election? You know, I think the American people are the ones that lose out mm -hmm. when you have that politically partisan, gridlocked uh, system in Washington, D.C. I think that's why everybody says Washington, D.C. is broken. Mm -hmm. And I tried really hard to reach across the aisle and try to find common ground with people, but it's a very difficult situation back there. And you have two sides uh, that are really trying to just promote their agenda, uh, and it makes it very difficult to uh, you know, get along and, and find common ground. But I think it's up to the people that elect their members of Congress. I think the people of America have to keep urging their members of Congress, their senators, to work together to find common ground mm -hmm. and not to uh, you know, work on issues that are so divisive to the country. I think there's things that we agree on. Mm -hmm. There's probably more that unites us than divides us, mm -hmm. but it seems like sometimes the two political parties focus on what divides us. And I, and I often wonder about that because, I mean, I think if you had a, a piece of paper with a line down the middle, like people will talk about, well, we don't want terrorists to come into our country. Well, no one wants terrorists to come right. into our country, but it's about how we go about that. So clearly I believe that we have more in common than, than not. But So you think it's up to us as the, the average voter then to to speak up and let our, our representatives know. I do. Know. You know, there were people that came to Congress that I worked with who literally took a pledge during their campaigns that said they would not compromise. Right. And I, I just think America can't send those kinds of people to Congress. You can't send people uh, to Congress that take pledges mm -hmm. or vow to not compromise. That's really right. no way to govern uh, the country. Right. And I think every one of us, no matter what uh, line of work we're in, we mm -hmm. compromise every, every minute yes. uh, yes. from the moment we walk into our, our work sites mm -hmm. to when we go home and probably mm -hmm. when we go home. We so this idea that people aren't compromising and they're sticking so hard to their principles that there's no middle ground, I think mm -hmm. the voters are the ones that have to change that. I find that people, uh, myself included some days, are somewhat uh, terrified or, or afraid that, wow, are things just so different now? I mean growing up in Alabama and the things that I lived through in the 60s and then you hear some of the rhetoric going on now especially in, in social media etc and then you hear about the cabinet selections uh, any thoughts on uh, now that the die is cast so to speak uh, how can we speak up about education and about uh, you know our legal system or whatever it may be what do you suggest from a community perspective, is it still speaking up to our congressional leaders? or? Well, and first of all, I mean, you're right. I hear it too. People are afraid. Mm -hmm. um, I have stories of teachers who are telling me that kids uh, are very anxious and have wow. a lot of anxiety. Uh, many kids are afraid, you know, one of their parents is going to get deported while they're right. at school. Uh, I think there has been given cover to racist rhetoric and mm -hmm name-calling that we didn't have, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, so it, it is scary. I know that people should speak up. And I was very heartened. I was part of the huge march in downtown Los Angeles right. where we had 750,000 right. people. Which was an amazing day. It was day. so amazing. And yeah. I spoke the there and, and around <laughs> the world. Yeah. So I think that, you know, we have to keep showing 
that, you know, every time our president says, this is what America wants, we have to say, wait a minute, that's mm -hmm. not what America wants. Mm -hmm. This is what America wants. I mean, because we uh, are America. We are America. <laughs> right. And let's remember, the country is divided. There's no question about it. Half the country feels one way, but the other half of the country feels another way, and we have to make our voice heard. Right. So in the short uh, minute or so that we have in this particular segment, I just want to start the transition now from Congress to supervisor. At what point did you realize that while leaving Congress and coming back to be supervisor in the 4th District would be the right move for you? What motivated that? I think for me, I probably always wanted to someday serve on the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Growing up, uh, you know, watching my dad, Kenny Hahn, be a county supervisor for 40 years, I got so close and personal to right. what that job meant and the people that he helped and the mm -hmm. change that uh, he was able to implement and the good that he was able to do. So I think I always wanted to serve on that. But for me, I think it was uh, being in Congress and realizing uh, that that was just not going to be the place that I could most you know, do, do good for people. It was too difficult to get things done. So when right. I knew that this seat was going to become open because Don Kanabi was retiring, I right. knew that this was the right time for me. If I really wanted to get something done, if I really wanted to help people, if I really wanted to serve the public, right. this was the job uh, that I wanted. Right. Which, when you talk about being a county supervisor in Los Angeles County, is a huge responsibility in terms of budget and number of people, et cetera. So what we'll do is take a really quick break and uh, when we come back, we will continue our conversation with Janice Hahn, a District 4 Supervisor. Stay tuned for more of Long Beach Lens. Hi, my name is C.T. Turney. I'm an attorney with the New Way of Life Reentry Project. We're part of several organizations in Long Beach who provide workshops, legal clinics, and support through the process of reclassifying your felony conviction. Prop 47 takes a number of low-level, nonviolent crimes like simple drug possession and petty theft and reduces them from a felony to a misdemeanor. This can open doors for you to apply for jobs, housing, and college loans. People call our courts the criminal justice system, but justice should not mean lifelong punishments for minor offenses. Justice should make people and communities whole while treating the underlying causes of crime and violence. Prop 47 is a major step towards this smart justice. It reduces the lifelong stigma of these convictions and it pushes back on the disproportionate prosecution of people of color for minor offenses. Visit our website and find out where the next opportunity is happening. And the window of time to apply for Prop 47 has been extended for another five years. So, change your record, and then share this information with someone you know who can benefit from Prop 47. Welcome back. I'm Derek J. Simpson, and LA County Supervisor Janice Hahn is with us. And before we left, we started the conversation about you transitioning from Congress back to uh, being a county supervisor. And I wanted to read a quote. We showed a quote right uh, coming back from the break, but Mayor Eric Garcetti mentions your devotion and compassion for poor and working class families. And I know 
having uh, interviewed you twice before, uh, that that is something very important to you. And, and how do you translate in, that into the work that you're doing as well? Well, I, I have a great uh, admiration for Mayor Eric Garcetti, and, and, and I appreciate him saying that about me, which is mm -hmm. why the job of county supervisor is so important right now. The county of Los Angeles is a safety net for people. Mm -hmm. We are there for people who have reached the end of their rope, you know, financially, mm -hmm. uh, mentally, physically, emotionally. That's what the county is there for. Um, and certainly people who, uh, you know, uh, are in poverty, uh, people who have mental health challenges, that's what this job is all about. Mm -hmm. Other jobs, city council members, school boards, members of Congress, sort of have a different focus. But the county supervisor is really there to make sure people don't fall through the cracks. And that yeah. um, is exactly where my heart is and what I want to do the most work in. And I know your father always uh, felt that it was important to put your constituents and neighbors, uh, neighborhoods first. And, Absolutely. You yeah. know, he, he took every, uh, you know, community block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, he was famous for putting in stop signs across the street from churches so uh, people mm -hmm. going to church could, could park in one place and walk safely to the church. I mean, right. he was known for putting in traffic signals, swimming pools, parks. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really believed in improving the quality of life for people. And that's the opportunity I have as a county supervisor. And uh, right. that, I'm looking forward to that. So when you talk about then those uh, types of priorities, uh, if you were to list off a few of your top priorities now that you're really getting your team together and sort of moving forward, what would some of those priorities be that we can look forward you to? You know, I think the first thing is homelessness. Uh, when I was on the campaign trail, everyone, you know, Marina Del Rey to Palos Verdes to mm -hmm. Long Beach right. to Whittier, it was homeless. And it's reached a crisis level here in L.A. County. We have 47,000 people every night sleeping on our streets. You can see them by the right. L.A. River. You can see them on the overpasses. It breaks my heart when it rains. Yes. Their, their tents are wet. Their clothes are wet. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're in a crisis. And of those 47,000 people, 3,000 are veterans, 4,000 are children, many of whom are sleeping in their cars at night and trying to go to school the next morning. Right. I've never seen it this bad, and I've lived in L.A. County my entire life. Uh, so I think uh, the constituents want us to work on it, and I as an elected official do, which is why the very first thing I did on my first meeting uh, was I partnered with Mark Ridley Thomas, and we co-authored the motion to put on the March ballot uh, measure H, which mm -hmm. if the voters will pass it on March 7th, it will raise $350 million annually through a quarter cent sales tax um, that mm -hmm. will fund services to help people break the cycle of being homeless. Uh, and I think it's a crisis and we need to address it. So that's my number one priority. So what's the feedback been on, on Measure 8 so far? Is it getting positive momentum? So far, there is no um, organized opposition to it. Good. We've had the business community, um, the nonprofit community, mm -hmm. the faith-based community, neighborhood mm -hmm. activists, the environmental community. Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone sees this as being sort of the, the issue that causes us all the most angst. I right. mean, no one can drive to work anymore or, right. or back home or, or to the grocery store without seeing someone uh, who's homeless. And, uh, you know, people right. are worried about another tax. Uh, right. But you know what? We're already paying for homelessness. And we're paying right. for it in ways that, uh, that that's more painful and less productive. Mm -hmm. Our sheriff's department, our law enforcement spent about $120 million arresting people and putting them in jail. Our health care. Uh, uh, places are spending millions of dollars to treat people who probably would be healthy if they had a warm uh, and dry and safe place to sleep. Mm -hmm. So there is a way to solve this problem, uh, and I think this is it. This so, is our chance. And, and speaking of that chance, and once the dollars are, let's say, Measure H is, mm -hmm. is passed, how then would it be uh, distributed throughout? The, would it come down to 
local cities in to right uh, so there will plans? there will be an oversight committee okay. uh, based uh, on you know again businesses right. our council of governments will have seats on it mm -hmm. uh, neighborhoods will have seats on it homeless service providers will have a seat on this planning right. group right. and they will work on uh, ways to get that money uh, right. back out to the communities based on the need but it really, it will, you know, all these nonprofits that are already out there doing the good work, right. who tell us they could do more if they only had more resources, yeah. this will be the resources. So yeah. these groups who are doing the work, you know, we're not going to create new organizations. This is not going to go to county government. Right. This money will go to those who are providing mental health um, yeah. care for people, for rapid rehousing. It will mm -hmm. go into to shelters. It will go into... Uh, you know, making it will go to help foster kids who are aged mm -hmm. out at 18 of our system and find themselves Homeless. without a place right. to live, a job, and really have nowhere to go. Well, and, and I ask that question because I do think that oftentimes things come from the top down instead of the bottom up. Yeah. And so it sounds like this, this is, is going to go from the bottom up. We know right. who is already out there doing good work, right. but they don't have, there's too crisis is too big. They're overwhelmed yeah. with the number of people that need help. Yeah. And this this money mm -hmm. will go to them uh, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. The tax only lasts for 10 years. And, you know, quarter cent sales tax, that's a dime on a $40 sweater. Right. It's a dollar on a $400 t TV. Mm -hmm. So it's very minuscule amount of money that we think mm -hmm. um, will go such a long way to, to finally ending homelessness in LA County. Small small contribution to make a big difference. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Now, beyond that, are there other initiatives? I know that uh, jobs are of some concerns. I know that there's some people are more concerned about potholes. But uh, for instance, your budget for a district, for those who don't know, generally speaking, what would the budget be that you oversee in, in your Well, area? I mean, the total county budget is $38 billion. So you have five people uh, that are looking at $38 billion to take care of the county. And that's to fund, of course, all of the services, our, our sheriff's department, our fire department, uh, you know, parks uh, departments, uh, you know, so mental health services. You know, we have the largest uh, public health system almost right. in the county, I mean, in this country. Right. Uh, so, you know, we have, we have a lot of dollars, but you're right, jobs is a, is a big, important mm -hmm. issue for me. But I want to combine job creation with transportation. You know, uh, the voters also just passed Measure M, right. which will raise about $120 billion mm -hmm. um, to fund transportation projects so that someday, soon, we will have a 21st century uh, transportation system in L.A. County. And I actually put an amendment in the transportation bill in Congress that said anytime the federal government funds part of your transportation project, mm -hmm. um, there should be a component where we reach out to uh, young people uh, and help get them apprenticeships mm -hmm. and put them on the pathway to a career mm -hmm. in transportation. We have so many careers associated with transportation that this is a great op opportunity not just to build the project, but right. to bring in a whole new uh, group of people who will could, we could put them on their path to long-term good careers. Yeah, and I think that's important in the sense that oftentimes uh, I say to even my team here that uh, my greatest fear is I don't know what I don't know. So from a youth perspective or young professionals, if they don't know what those particular pathways are in that industry, they don't know to pursue that or, or prepare themselves or aspire uh, to do that. So I think it's great that you're you're trying to shine a light on those opportunities. Well, sure. and outreach is, is a big piece of that because right. what you said is true. There's a lot of young people out there that wouldn't know yeah. that this might be an opportunity. So I'm really encouraging our folks at Metro, uh, which I also sit on as a board of director, right. to make sure that they are doing a good uh, outreach uh, every part of the county mm -hmm. uh, to make sure we can interest some of these young people in, in a career path. Were there any surprises when you when you took this new position? I mean, were there things like, wow, I didn't realize it was this good or this bad, or or is it just pretty much what you thought and you just have to put your, your mark on it? No, it's, uh, you know, it's it's obviously, it's better than I, than I thought. Um, That's great. But it's, the county of Los Angeles is enormous. It is. Um, <laughs> it is larger than all but seven states. 
uh, in this country. So all again, but seven states. Yes, yes. So the, <laughs> just the crazy. county, right. uh, and of course a thirty-eight billion dollar uh, budget. So I mm. think I'm learning, and the the issues um, that we're going to be grappling with. I mean, mm. you know, immigrant rights is a huge issue in LA County. Mm -hmm. Public safety is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Of course, homeless, transportation. Uh, I mean, the, the issues are gigantic. Our, we, we oversee, you know, the juvenile justice system. We oversee the jails, mm -hmm. you know, foster care. So the issues are enormous. I do a lot of reading and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm struck at how big this county is, but mm -hmm. what a great opportunity is to really to help people. We only have a few minutes left. The time is going by so fast. So if I could close with your vision that you want to leave with, just not just from your perspective, but that you want us to, as citizens of the 4th District and the county, support you in, what would that vision be? You know, um, hopefully, you know, the, the, the voters of the 4th District will um, agree that uh, Measure H is worth voting for and investing in mm -hmm. uh, so we can... Uh, long term really improve the quality of life of all of our neighborhoods and all of our communities by knowing that deep inside we are better than having 47,000 people sleeping on our streets at any mm -hmm. given evening. We're better than that. I know we are. Mm -hmm. So like to reach into the better angels of ourselves. Um, and then to know that, um, you know, I, I'm lucky to, to get to represent the 4th District. And I want people in the 4th District to know that I'm on their side. I'm on their side. You know, uh, we're going to work to improve your communities, we're going to work to make sure we can reduce traffic congestion and make sure these projects that are being built come to your community. Mm -hmm. I want people to know they're going to get their fair share with me because I think people have felt left out in certain areas of the 4th mm -hmm. District and I, I want them to know that uh, together we're going to solve the big problems uh, that come our way. And knowing you, as I've had the honor and pleasure to get to know you, I know we're going to make that happen. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks, Sarah. You're the only three-time returnee to That's Long awesome. Beach Lands, and we love you for that. Let's make a four. Yes, we will. We will. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. I'd like to thank L.A. County Supervisor Janice Hahn for joining us today on, on the Long Beach Lens Show. Be sure to follow PatNet TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. We also welcome your comments and thoughts regarding this show as we strive to make Long Beach Lens a favorite source of local news, information, and entertainment. This show has been brought to you with support from the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Thank you for watching Long Beach Lens. Thank you.